everyone, and welcome to Marlins All Access, brought to you by your local Toyota dealers. I'm Jessica Blaylock, and we have a special treat for you today to give us some insight into the newest Marlins draft picks. We are joined by the head of scouting for the Marlins, DJ Spillick. This was obviously a very unique draft with the delay of the Major League Baseball season, with COVID-19, everything that's been going on. Set the scene for us a little bit. What was it like preparing for this year's draft, especially knowing there were only going to be five rounds? Exhausting, frustrating, <laughs> exciting, um, challenging. It was, it, was, it was a lot of, it was a lot of everything. Um, we do have a lot of information with a lot of the college players but we had to make sure with the high school players that we had enough information to make the pick. And I think that the more, the deeper and deeper we dove into this with our analytics team and with our scouting staff, we found that the common theme, the common link, whether we took a position, we ended up taking a lot of pitching, obviously, but the common link needed to be a certain a level of certainty that made us very comfortable with the player. Uh, there needed to be a known so that tended to be the common theme throughout throughout our selections. It ended up being a lot of pitching, obviously, or all pitching. But that there were other position players that we really liked that were on our board that we felt very strongly about. But that common link between all the players was working through a process that got us much, much closer to the known than the unknown. We didn't feel like taking uncalculated risks in this draft would be a very smart decision. So everything that we selected was based on all of the information we had, and we tried to fill up as much as we could. You mentioned, especially with high school students, obviously the end of the school year being put off, championship tournaments and so forth. What was the biggest challenge of this year's draft? Was it evaluating the high school players or was it something else? I think the biggest challenge was the lack of information. We scout we do a significant amount of work on our high school talent in the summer and the fall. And I think you'd get, you, you would hear that echoed throughout most major league front offices. So the period that literally starts next week and goes all the way through next spring for the 2020 draft, 2021 draft is a critical, critical time. And the ability to scout that is really, really important. However, you come out of that, with certain levels of knowns and unknowns. And when you don't have an opportunity in the spring to answer those questions, it makes it very difficult on the high school players. We're an organization and we've shown this, we really like high school players. But if you really like high school players and you have to get those answers in the spring and you're not able to get them, it makes it very uncomfortable to pull the magnet. And I'm not talking about Mick Abel who went to the Phillies, phenomenal prospect. I'm not talking about Robert Hassel or Zach Veen or the case of Dax Fulton, the, the, the high, high-end high school player answered the question. He, he answered it in this, in this summer. So you have that opportunity to pull the magnet. That next wave down becomes very, very difficult. And if you couldn't answer it in the spring, it leads you down this road that we took. I think one thing that's been incredible to watch over the past couple of seasons is the way that this organization has completely revitalized the farm system. Knowing what you have, in the minor leagues, were you looking for players who were big league ready or were you really honing in on best available player at mm -hmm. the position? Yeah, uh, that's a multi-layered question. Generally speaking, I don't think anybody would disagree that you're trying to take best player available, but you're also trying to understand what the market is and what what the market is offering you in any given year. And in this particular year, the market was clear. It was a huge pitching market. You look at your organization and you ask yourself, where are we? And the, our ability to match a layer that we may need with what the market was providing allowed us to focus in on this. Now, that's not to say that there weren't position players in here that we, that we really liked. There were some position players that went to other teams that we really liked. But then it becomes, as the draft falls, you take the players in the order of talent that you had them, and it just ended up falling with a lot of arms. You know with the third pick, 
you're going to get an elite player. There were a lot of great options. I know a lot of projections had Asa Lacey. Shows that projections aren't always right. But yeah. uh, Austin Martin was a great player available. You ended up taking Max Meyer. What was it about Max that made him the pick for you? Max Meyer was clearly the most athletic, electric pitcher on this board that was closest to major league ready. And the more we dug in on Max as we approached the finish line, what we were left with was a player that was in an area of the draft, not just for the Miami Marlins, but for the industry, that the barriers to entry are so difficult to get in. For a six foot right-handed pitcher to work his way into this area, he has to overcome a lot. But once they get there, it's hard to pass them because history's on their side. So when we dug into Max and his athleticism, and the now stuff, which is elite, his competitive drive, the freshness of his arm, and what we knew about the player and his development curve, it became really, really clear that Max Meyer was the guy that we wanted. So that's what we went with. So often we hear that, hey, left-handed pitchers are gems, right? You know, so rare if you can find a lefty, that's a great thing. It sounds like you knew 100% Max was your guy. Knowing that there was a chance maybe you could get Dax later on. Did that make it a little bit easier to know you could maybe pass on a lefty in the first round and, and wait for another guy? Yeah, that's a, you're, <clears throat> you're going right after the 400 level scouting question. <laughs> and that's a, that's a very, um, that's a very good point. I think what happens, those, those conversations absolutely happen in draft rooms. But at the top of the board, you have to take the player that you really, really want. You, because the, the, the differences are razor thin. They're razor thin. And when you get into a situation where you have to, take, you have to make a decision, I would never take a player out of fear of what he might be. I'll always select the player of what I think he is and will be. And when you get to that finish line and you're staring down two elite prospects, that was the perspective because those multiple players up there are warranted. They're, they're all good options to select. You knew you were going to get a good player or pitcher. You take the player that you believe is going to, and what he's going to become. So when you make the Max Meyer pick, you take it because you believe that he's an elite starting pitcher in the big leagues. And that's it. The fact that you knew that we had a high comfort level, that a player like Dax Fulton would be available on day two, knowing our draft position, that certainly makes it a little bit more comfortable. That's a bonus, but that's not the sole reason why you take Max Meyer. You take Max Meyer because you think he's the most elite arm on the board. I love it. Hearing you talk about Max makes me so excited to see his potential. I mean, you've already used words like athletic, electric. I know Mike Hill mentioned because he played hockey, he's never going to back down. He wants to beat you before you can beat him. He's got that hockey mentality. How would you describe the most electric aspect of his stuff and what he can add to this organization? Max Meyer is highly, highly competitive, highly competitive. And I have multiple examples of why and what he, how he's wired. I remember in our interview, I asked him, how does a forward, I played hockey growing up. So how do, a forward is supposed to be a goal scorer. A forward isn't supposed to be the enforcer. A forward isn't supposed to lead his team in penalty minutes, but Max did. And I remember when I asked him that question, he said something to the effect, yeah, I just like to get greasy. You know, he's a highly competitive kid. And when you watch him pitch, it's pretty, pretty obvious. You look at Team USA and the Team USA pedigree that he had from being an elite closer for Team USA as a freshman and then being an elite starter for Team USA as a sophomore, having contacts behind the 
behind the scenes that allow you to know what he's like in the dugout, that certainly makes you really excited about who he is and his competitive spirit. So that's number one that you referenced. Number two, what's most exciting about his stuff and his, what's most electric? Well, it's both things. It's, it's his fastball and his slider combination. When you sit and watch Max Meyer at six foot, 190 to 200, he's up to 200 pounds now. So he's not small or little. He's just not six four. When you watch Max Meyer, the most exciting thing is the electric fastball that sits comfortably, comfortably at about 94 to 97, which is an elite major league fastball, and gets all the way up to 100 in north. And then you combine that with a slider that I just, I think of, not just me, but people that have seen Max Meyer and they watch his slider at 89 and 93, you find yourself looking at each other when you're watching them pitch and you're going, guys are going, is that the best I've ever seen? I don't know if it's the best I've ever seen, but I can tell you this, when you start having that thought, that just means it's really, really good. You know, and you start to say to people, you know, 10 years from now, we're going to be watching a game and we're going to be watching a young pitcher and we're going to say, oh, that's a heck of a slider. And the guy next to you is going to look at you and say, is it a Max Meyer slider? That in and of itself speaks volumes about what that pitch is all about. And the next thing that makes me really excited about him that I wouldn't describe it as electric, it's the potential. This player hasn't been coached. We've interviewed all the coaches. We've done all the work over there. And when this player showed up at the University of Minnesota as a 150-pound athlete, he was a two-way player at Minnesota. The coaches backed off. He was so elite that they just backed off. This kid is self-taught. He's not in the he's not in front of machines. He's not throwing weighted balls. He, and there's nothing wrong with that. But he hasn't done any of that stuff. This is just pure natural talent. So we felt strongly that the opportunity to put him in front of our player development staff, which we believe Scott Eldred and his staff do a phenomenal job. And you take that type of natural talent and you start to introduce him to some things that he's never been introduced to. You start to wonder, did we just, ca did we just catch the next Roy Oswalt? Did we ca catch the next Brett Saberhagen or David Cohn? Or did we just catch that guy, Lincecum? And, and so ultimately, all of those things uh, got us really, really excited about what he is now and what he has the potential to be. One thing we keep hearing with Max Meyer, he's very close to being big league ready. Yeah. How do you navigate helping him make that transition with also him being close to being mm -hmm. big league ready? What is the plan with approaching a guy like Max Meyer? That's a good question. Uh, that's out of my jurisdiction. <laughs> that's a, I certainly have some input on that and I have some ideas and thoughts there, but that's a front office decision. When we selected Max Meyer, we selected him for what his future was going to be. It's, it's a bonus that we believe he's big league ready, but in this current environment, I'm not sure exactly what we're going to do, um, what the plan yet is for him. Uh, we, we have a lot of, the, the beauty of it is we have a lot of options with Max and the one thing we need to do is, is pull it back a little bit because it's like a thoroughbred that just wants to run. So I think the, probably the biggest objective here is to make sure that he is ready to go, that we develop him properly so that when the time comes, he's as impactful in the major leagues as we expect him to be. You, an example is um, a very uh, relevant, um, recent example would be the White Sox and what they did with Chris Sale. When they pulled Chris Sale off the board, they knew he was major league ready. That's not to say we're going to follow that development path, but there would be an example of a player where they developed him in a certain way, and then ultimately they moved him into what they thought he was as an elite major league starter. So, I can't wait to see him. I cannot wait to see him. You're getting me so excited about him, DJ. All right, let's move on to the lefty, Dax Fulton. What impressed you about this guy, especially considering that he's 18 years old? Yeah. What impressed me about Dax Fulton, he was the best high school left-handed pitcher in the country and may have been the best high school pitcher in the country until he hurt his arm. We saw multiple outings from him this summer. You're talking about a 6'6 left-handed pitcher that's really young with clean mechanics that's 90 to 95 with a hammer. And when we watch this player pitch, oh, excuse me, and he throws strikes. 
So when you start combining mechanics with now stuff and strikes out of a young man who at 6'6", 220, is probably going to grow to about 6'6", 240, you're talking about a big league workhorse that can handle the innings. He's got a pitch package to be an ace. That there's not much, not, there's not much you can't like about that. You start thinking about guys like John Lester and and that type of stuff, and you go, "Wow, we just we just selected the best left-handed pitcher in the country." And things that you things that you hear in the scouting industry is, if this guy goes to school, he will be this. There were two pitchers in this country that I would say that about. The guy the Phillies took and Mick Abel and Dax Fulton. And when you have an opportunity to acquire one of those two players, you cannot pass it up because when they do go to college, these are the guys that become the number one. This is Max Meyer. This is Asa Lacey. This is Emerson Hancock. And we had an opportunity to take this in the second round. You cannot pass that up. A lot of people say that Dax has such a good feel for his changeup. Is that mm -hmm. one of the pitches that really stood out to you? And how much room does he have to grow with maybe that pitch in his arsenal? Yeah, I didn't <clears throat> I didn't even touch on the changeup. Dax has a full pitch package. He has a full pitch package. He has feel to pitch. Most of the time, when you run into high school pitchers, on the, <clears throat> when you're scouting them in the summertime, they're trying to impress with their stuff. And you get them in these short two to three inning outings where they go out there and they just try to blow up the gun and they just try to impress you with their heater. Dax had some of that stuff in his arsenal, but what made it so unique about Dax is he threw strikes to your point. He did have a changeup and that speaks to feel. And that, that's a separating factor for a lot of these young high school guys, guys that you believe can come in, throw strikes with a good pitch package and they have mechanics and bodies, excuse me, mechanics and bodies that are going to allow them to just continue on their development curve, you get really excited about that. So, yes, I, I mean, I do think that he had a nice feel for his changeup as well. Dax himself said that he really loves Clayton Kershaw. He models his game after Kershaw, and he especially loves the emotion that Clayton pitches with. Do you see some of those characteristics in him even at this young age? You nailed it. <laughs> okay. You nailed Perfect. it. You said it. <laughs> Perfect analysis right there. Okay, awesome. Um, any concern Any concern at all with him coming off of Tommy John surgery, or do you feel like that's an opportunity for him to get even stronger? Good question. Opportunity. The only reason why Dax Fulton was anywhere close to where we put him or where he was selected at 40, the only reason was because he had Tommy John. So obviously we talked about that as we were working through this idea of selecting him and, uh, in the draft. There's a lot of information and history and data that would suggest this is a very, very good calculated move here by the Marlins. As soon as this player is healthy, he's going to be – he has an opportunity to explode on the scene in the minor leagues. Um, and, yes, you, that's a good point that you made, and we did talk about that. He's really far along on his on his Tommy John recovery. He had the Tommy John back in September, so he's already throwing a baseball. I think the opportunity here with Dax is to help him just continue to add size and strength and athleticism to his body over the next six or seven months as we move closer to next year. I think it's a great opportunity for him. Um, so pretty soon we're going to have Max, Dax, and Brax in our major league rotation. I thought that'd be pretty cool. The media is going to love it. I think Don Mattingly is going to love it too. I think that's going to yeah. be a lot of fun for everyone. Mm -hmm. All right, let's stick with pitching because like you said, that was really the theme with the selections in this year's draft. With the 61st overall pick, you took righty Kyle Nicholas. What did you like about him? That one was easy. Those are two of the best pitches in the entire country. I think it's undeniable. You're talking about a, a 6'4 right-hander that has a great body, above average to plus athleticism, 
a now 65 fastball that goes up to about 98, 99, and an absolute wipeout breaking ball. That's what we loved about him. He's a good athlete. He was a two guard in basket on a state championship basketball team. He was a late bloomer. You look into his history and you find out that his uncle, that's his mom's brother, is Todd Blackledge, NFL quarterback. You find out that this player is very intelligent and graduated college in three years. There's a lot of markers here that you had an opportunity to select a player that can be a mid to front of the rotation guy down the road. So that was an exciting, exciting pick for the Marlins. We know that Vanderbilt has an elite college baseball program. We've seen selections out of Vandy before when it comes to the Marlins. Another selection, Jake Eater, who also mm-hmm. happens to be a local guy from Fort Lauderdale. What did you like about him? Oh, another guy full of potential, full of untapped potential. I think Jake Eater, he's, he has mechanics, I believe, that you can, um, you can refine his mechanics down and you pair that together with a full pitch package and a left hand in a 6'4", durable left-handed pitcher. And there's not much to, not to get excited about that. It's a now fastball that's 91 to 95, a now major league breaking ball, a now major league changeup. So Jake, and, he, and he's taking the ball, and he's durable. And it's – so there was a lot to like about Jake Eater, um, I think, down the board. Making him a local guy is, you know, it's kind of icing on the cake. Um, but it is it is nice to lean into a program like Vanderbilt where you know that everything's been done behind the scenes to help this player become a good player. And you know that he's been already been around good coaches. So – um, that gives you a lot of confidence that he's just going to continue on down that line of success and uh, show up here and, and we'll continue to help him and, and uh, help him be a little bit more consistent, but a very, very good pitcher with a full pitch package. All right. And one more pitcher for you, Kyle Hurd out of USC. What stood out to you about Kyle that you wanted to select him? Kyle Hurd has been a very, very good prospect going all the way back to high school. Uh, I think the the only reason why you get a guy like Kyle Hurt down here in the fifth round is inconsistency. Is a player that, for for a number of different reasons, may not have lived up to the expectation of what he was supposed to be. However, he turned into a completely different pitcher this year. We had the opportunity. We have some really good scouts in California. Eric Brock, Tim McDonald, our cross our West Coast cross checker, are very good out there. They stayed with this guy. And as inconsistent as he was early in his college career, the new coaching staff at USC really helped this young man turn the corner this year. And you're talking about a 6'3", 215-pound guy with good mechanics that pitches in the mid-90s with a right now major league breaking ball and an elite changeup. And, and you look at that and you say, how did that just fall in our lap? It's amazing what happens when people – continue to think about the past and the inconsistencies and they don't pay enough attention to what the player is, is becoming. And what we know is pitchers blossom and they, they become who they are at a much later date than much later time than position players. So we had an opportunity to, to catch a player that we think has just as much potential as a lot of the other players that were selected ahead of him in the draft, not just on our, not just the players that we selected, but players that were selected from other teams. So we were ex- really excited to get, size, strength, and stuff out of Kyle Hurt. Last question for you, DJ, because you've been very generous with your time. How do you tackle the signing period this year? Wasn't good for – it wasn't good for baseball that we had five rounds. It really wasn't. Um, there's a lot of players that have devoted their whole life to this. So you can imagine waking up today as a really good college baseball player, and it's gone. And you're going to go back to college as a 22- or a 23-year-old where you're, you're starting to probably, it's just not a good situation. So for us, we need to, to try to target the players that A, we believe in their talent, and B, we think they want to and need to start their professional careers. So we're working through that today with our player development department, with our analytics team, trying to target some players that we think would be a good fit. You know, We brought in a great class, I'm very, very happy. Uh, with the class that we brought in. The common theme, obviously, is pitching, but it was huge, big power arms. Every one of these guys comes in with a power arm and a right-now breaking ball. 
And that gets you really, really excited as an organization. And as we move forward, we have to look at some of the things that were that, some gaps we need to fill in the organization and the types of players that might help us fill those gaps and the types of players that want to, that would want to sign. So. Well, to echo the sentiments of Mike Hill, you can never have enough pitching, right? What do they say? It takes three to get one. <laughs> exactly. Well, do so you we think took you, six. <laughs> even better. Thank you so much for the time and certainly appreciate all the insight. I know it's been a very, very busy period for you. So thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy schedule to join me. Absolutely. Thank you. This has been Marlins All Access brought to you by your local Toyota dealers.